Hello there. Today we're going to finish up chapter 13. This is lecture number six. We're going to be going over sections 13.5 through 13.6 in our book. Today we're going to be looking at colligative properties. We're going to know which properties are colligative properties at the end of this and how colligative properties work. And we're going to look at how electrolytes and non-electrolytes differ in reference to colligative properties. One of our colligative properties we're going to look at is vapor pressure. And at the end of this, we are going to be able to calculate our vapor pressure over a solvent, or of a solvent over a solution. So what is our vapor pressure of a solution? Um, we will also look at boiling point and freezing point, and we're going to be able to calculate the boiling point and freezing point of an aqueous mixture using the boiling point and freezing points of our solvent. Uh, we'll also be able to, from there, calculate our molar mass if we have our boiling points and freezing points. Lastly, we want to be able to calculate the Van Hoff factor using all of this information. So if we have our boiling point and freezing point, um, we should be able to use that information to calculate our Van Hoff factor. We're going to be looking at osmosis and osmotic pressure. We'll be able to know what both of those terms mean at the end of this, and we'll be able to calculate our osmotic pressure of an aqueous solution. In addition, we'll be able to calculate our Van Hoff factor using osmotic pressure and molar mass using osmotic pressure. Then we'll look at uh, colloids. And we should, at the end of this, know what the Tyndall effect is, how it applies to colloids, what the different types of colloids are, and then look at Brownian motion, how it applies to both gases and colloids. So our colligative properties themselves are properties that depend on the number of particles that are dissolved within a solvent. So how a solute uh, or the number of solute particles changes a particular property. It doesn't matter about the identity of the particles, just the number of particles. Colligator uh, equals or means collective. And the more particles we have, the greater effect we will have on our colligative properties. Some examples of colligative properties, so properties are affected by the amount of solute, are vapor pressure, freezing point, boiling point, and osmotic pressure. We're going to get vapor pressure lowering, freezing point depression, uh, boiling point elevation, and we will see how osmotic pressure is um, affected. Our Van Hoff factor is one of the things we look at. It's a factor that take, is taken into account in all colligative properties. It is a way of looking at dissociation of ionic compounds. If you remember from chapter 11 and several other chapters, we talked about how ionic compounds dissolve differently in aqueous medium than non-ionic compounds. Ionic compounds break down into ions. So when an ionic compound breaks down, it breaks down into more particles than a non-electrolyte. Uh, so our Van Hoff factor takes into the account our dissociation, and we look at it as the moles of particles in solution over the moles of solute dissolved. Okay. Colligative properties themselves. Um, when we think about colligative properties or the effect on colligative properties, we always think about an equilibrium process. And in that equilibrium process, solvents must cross a boundary. So in order to get from the liquid phase to the gas phase or the vapor phase, we need a liquid particle to break the surface of the liquid to go into the gas phase. When we're thinking again about colligative properties, as we add a solute in, that solute is going to block the surface. So it's going to, you know, prevent solvent molecules from crossing the boundary. In this, it'll lower the rate of solvent molecules crossing the boundary in one direction. This in turn causes a shift in the equilibrium. That shift in the equilibrium can be measured as a colligative property. Our first colligative property is vapor pressure lowering. When we have a pure liquid in a closed container, we can get to an equilibrium vapor pressure. So this equilibrium process occurs when our liquid is vaporizing at the same rate as our vapor is condensing. So we have a very specific vapor pressure because of that dynamic equilibrium that is achieved in a closed container. As we add a non-volatile solute, this is going to disrupt the equilibrium. 
So what's going to happen is there are going to be fewer solvent molecules at the surface, so fewer molecules that can go into the vapor phase. As such, we will have a lower or slower rate of evaporation. Additionally, another thing that occurs when we add a non-volatile solute is that there are more collisions and more attractive forces between solute and solvent um, occurring, keeping those uh, solvent molecules in the liquid phase. After that, equilibrium will be reestablished. That will occur more quickly than it before um, with fewer molecules in the vapor phase. That in turn will lower our vapor pressure. Okay, so, so far we have looked at how vapor pressure is lowered by adding in a solute. The uh, lowering of vapor pressure is a colligative property. It is based on the amount of particles. The greater the number of particles, the greater the vapor pressure lowering. So, I ask you if there are two solutions, one made by 0.5 grams of sodium chloride dissolved in 0.5 liters of water, and one made by dissolving one gram of sugar in 0.5 uh, liters of water, which solution will have the lower vapor pressure? I don't want you to tell me what the vapor pressure is, I just want you to know which solution will have a lower vapor pressure. Okay, so some things to keep in mind. First, sodium chloride, as we dissolve it in water, we get ions. So we've got a case where we go from one mole to two moles. So for every one mole of sodium chloride, we produce two moles of particles. Sugar, on the other hand, is a non-electrolyte. So when we add it to water, we just solubilize it. Solvation process. Oh, excuse me, thank you. So this is just a solvation process. This is not a breaking apart into ions. So very important, okay? Now we wanna use our masses in order to figure out how many particles we're actually gonna produce. So since we have the same number or the same volume in both cases, we're not talking about um, a changing of volume, so we don't have to think about concentration as much. But let's see. So we have 0 0.500 grams of sodium chloride and 0 0.500 liters. Same thing here. We have 0 0.5, oh, sorry. One point zero zero grams of sugar in zero point five zero zero liters. Okay, so we have the same volume. Colligative properties based on the number of particles, but specifically the number of particles in a given volume. So because these are equivalent, we don't really have to think about them. If we did have different volumes, we would have to divide it out. Okay, so let's convert moles of sodium chloride, or grams of sodium chloride, into moles of sodium chloride using our molar mass. And then we want to go from moles of sodium chloride into moles of particles. So there are two moles of particles for every one mole of sodium chloride. And this gives us 0 0.0171 moles of particles in that 0 0.500 liters. Same thing here. We want to go from grams of sugar to moles of sugar to moles of particles. We have a molar mass of 342.30 grams. And we have one mole of particles per mole of sugar. Multiply it out, we get 0 0.00292 moles of particles in that same volume, 0 0.500 liters. We see that this has a greater concentration of particles, so the sodium chloride will have a lower vapor pressure.
Okay. We will look at how to calculate this um, here in this lecture with Raoult's Law. Raoult's Law is going to be how we calculate vapor pressure, and it's going to be based on the mole fraction of our solvent. So the equation is our vapor pressure of our solution is equal to the vapor pressure of our solvent times by our solvent's mole fraction. This is only for non-volatile solutes. We have a different equation for volatile solutes. Um, so we have P as our vapor pressure of our solution, P naught as the vapor pressure of our solvent, and X or chi as the mole fraction of our solvent. Keep in mind that our mole fraction of our solvent will be equal to one minus the mole fraction of our solute. So if you need to calculate the mole fraction of our solute, you just need to put it into this equation. Okay, so let's try this out. We've got the vapor pressure of pure water at 110 degrees being 1070 torr. Another thing to keep in mind about vapor pressure is vapor pressure is temperature dependent. So when looking at these equations or these problems, you have to have the same temperature for these. So we look and we say, okay, we have a solution of ethylene glycol in water. It has a vapor pressure of one atmosphere at 110 degrees Celsius. We're good. We have the same temperature so we can compare them. If we assume that Raoult's law is avoided, what is the mole fraction of ethylene glycol in the solution? So we've got the vapor pressure of our solvent. We have the vapor pressure of our solution. Um, and from that information, we can figure out the mole fraction of our solvent and then figure out the mole fraction of our solute. First thing we want to do is we want to have the same term for pressure. We have tors and atmospheres. I'm just going to put them both in tors. So one atmosphere. Remember one atmosphere is the same as 760 tor. So one atmosphere is 760 tor. And now we can put this into our equation. P solution is equal to P solvent times by X solvent. This looks very, very much like Dalton's law, right? So keep that in mind. We have similar equations. So our solution is 760 torr vapor pressure. Our solvent is 1070 torr. Again, this is vapor pressure lowering. So our solvent has a greater vapor pressure than our solution. And then we're gonna multiply that by our mole fraction of our solvent. And when we do this, we can solve for our mole fraction of our solvent. And that'll be equal to 0 0.70, 710. And then subtract that from one we get an X or a mole fraction for our solute equal to 0 0.290. So these two will equal one. Okay, it's pretty easy. Okay. So if we have an ideal solution, this will be any solution that obeys Raoult's law. Kind of like an ideal gas is one that obeys the ideal gas law. Um, so Raoult's Law, if a solution obeys Raoult's Law, it's considered an ideal solution. If we have um, solute and solvent intermolecular forces roughly equal to our solvent intermolecular forces, we should have an ideal solution. So solvent, solvent, solute, solute, roughly equal. If we have a case where our solvent-solvent interactions are greater or stronger than our solvent solute interactions, we have a, a case where our vapor pressure will be greater than what we predict using Raoult's law. So Raoult's law will actually predict a lower vapor pressure than we actually see experimentally. If our solvent solute interactions are stronger than our solvent solvent interactions, our actual vapor pressure will be lower than what Raoult's law um, predicts. So will get a higher than um, our experimental vapor pressure will be lower than our calculated vapor pressure. We also want to look at volatile solutes real quick. So a volatile solute is one that has a substantial vapor pressure. So if we have an ideal solution, 
we can still have uh, a solution that um, follows Rowlett's Law, so we can still figure out what its vapor pressure is using Rowlett's Law. We're just going to have to do a little bit of um, tinkering with it in order to figure it out for a volatile solute. So if we have a volatile solute, we are having a solute that has a vapor pressure on its own. So we have a solvent that has a vapor pressure and a solute that has a vapor pressure. To account for both of them, we just sum the solute and solvent vapor pressures. So this still has to obey Rowlett's Law, so our solute-solvent interactions have to be similar to solvent-solvent-solute-solute. Solute. But all we do is we apply Rowlett's Law to both substances. So we take our A substance, um, we figure out its solution, um, its solution uh, vapor pressure by timesing its uh, mole fraction by its normal vapor pressure. We do that same thing for our additional substance and we just add them together. So we add our vapor pressures um, for our two solutions and we um, get our total vapor pressure of our solution. Pretty easy. Let's look at our deviations from ideal behavior. So here we see an ideal behavior. Our pressures are going to equal our vapor pressure of our solution, um, whether it is uh, volatile or non-volatile. However, we can have what's called a positive deviation or a negative deviation. A positive deviation is one where the vapor pressure of the solution is greater than expected using Rowlett's Law. A negative deviation is when we have a vapor pressure lower than I expected for Rowlett's Law. So when we have non-ideal behavior, we have a, a, sub, or a case where we have solute-solvent interactions being especially strong or especially weak. So if we have strong solute-solvent interactions, we have a lower than expected vapor pressure, so we have a negative deviation. If we have weak solute-solvent interactions, we have a higher than expected vapor pressure, so a positive deviation. Okay. Let's move on to boiling point elevation and freezing point depression, our next two um, colligative properties we're gonna look at. So first one we're gonna look at is freezing point depression. Freezing point depression means that we depress our freezing point or we decrease our freezing point of the pure solvent. So the solution will have a lower freezing point than the pure solvent. This occurs because in order to get a solid, we have to have an ordering of our molecules. They must be in a repeating lattice structure. And if we have solute molecules, they get in the way. That makes this ordering much more difficult. So in order to actually get ordering, we have to lower our temperature or lower our freezing point in order to get that um, consistent repeating arrangement. With our boiling point, as we add a solvent, we increase our boiling point. Or sorry, as we add a solute, we increase our boiling point of our solvent. So an increase relative to the pure solvent's boiling point. So this has a lot to do with what happens with vapor pressure. So as we have solute molecules that are, those are going to block the surface of the uh, solvent, making it harder for the solvent molecules to escape um, the liquid phase into the gas phase. We also have intermolecular forces that form between our um, solute and solvent causing that escape from the liquid phase a little bit harder as well. We can see this when we look at a phase diagram. So this blue line you see is going to be the line after adding in a solvent, or sorry, a solute. So this will be our solution, our new solution uh, phase diagram, the blue line. So in the mixture, our vapor pressure curve shifts downwards. Um, that causes or that, that is seen with this uh, change in boiling point. So as it shifts down, our boiling point increases at one atmosphere. Um, we also see the triple point lowering. And we can see 
that our solid uh, liquid equilibrium line shifts to the left or shifts to lower temperature, and we can see that delta Tf right there going to the left. Um, the amount of solute you add, or the concentration of that solute that, that you add, the greater that concentration, the greater the shift in this phase diagram, the greater the shift in your boiling point and freezing point. We have equations that express our boiling point um, elevation and freezing point depression. For our boiling point, our boiling point elevation, delta Tb, um, is equal to the boiling point of our solution minus the boiling point of our solvent. So we can actually figure out what that freezing or that boiling point elevation is, or we can estimate it using this equation um, using the Van Hoff factor I our molar boiling point elevation constant and our molality. We can do the same thing for freezing point depression. We can figure out our freezing point depression by taking the freezing point of our solution, subtracting out the freezing point of our solvent. And we can estimate that using our Van Hoff factor, our molar freezing point elevation, or sorry, freezing point depression constant and our molality. Um, this is negative because this is depression. This is positive because this is elevation. Okay. So Kb is a molar freezing point elevation constant. Kf is a molar freezing point depression constant. For water, we have a Kb of 0.51 degrees Celsius per molality, and for our Kf of water, we have 1.86 degrees Celsius per molality. Those will be given um, along with these equations. Our Van Hoff factor itself, as I said earlier, measures the extent of ionization. So if we are estimating our freezing point depression or our uh, boiling point elevation, we would say that I is equal to the number of ions in solution per empirical unit. So for our ions, we use that. And then non-electrolytes, I will be equal to one because there is no dissociation. So for every one mole of particle, we get one mole of, or for every one mole of uh, our molecule, we get one mole of particle. We can, if we have experimentally um, determined our freezing point depression or boiling point elevation, we can measure or calculate out our Van Hoff factor. So they are generally experimentally determined if you don't uh, just estimate it. Van Hoff factors themselves are going to vary with concentration. So the greater the concentration, the smaller the Van Hoff factor. Um, the only time that you'll have a Van Hoff factor, an experimentally determined Van Hoff, Van Hoff factor that approaches a whole number is if you have a dilute solution. As you become more and more concentrated, that Van Hoff factor is going to decrease. The Van Hoff factor itself is going to have an effect on all colligative properties. If we assume complete an ionization, it should be equal to the number of ions per empirical unit. It'll be less than that if we have incomplete ionization, if we have something called ion pairing, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And it should be equal to one if we have a non-electrolyte, so no dissociation whatsoever. If we have a measured property, so if we have a boiling point elevation or a freezing point depression or a vapor pressure lowering, we can actually determine our experimental Van Hoff factor by taking that measured property whatever the depression or elevation is, and dividing it by what that property would be if we calculate it for a non-electrolyte. So if we put I equals one into our equations. So let's try uh, and see if we can figure out how to solve for molar mass using um, our freezing point depression. And we'll also look at solving for our Van Hoff factor. So. We have got camphor. Camphor, pure camphor, melts at 179.8 degrees Celsius. It has a 
freezing point depression constant of 40.0 degrees Celsius over molality. If we take that camphor and we put 0.186 grams of an unknown substance into 22.01 grams of liquid camphor, we get a freezing point of 176.7 degrees Celsius. So that is what it has depressed to. From this information, we want to determine our molar mass. Okay, so let's look and see what we have. We have our Kf, that is equal to 40.0 degrees Celsius over molality. We have our delta Tf, right, so our change or depression of our freezing point. So that would be equal to our uh, freezing point of our solution minus the freezing point of our solvent. So it would be 176.7 degrees Celsius minus 179.8 degrees Celsius, giving us a freezing point depression of negative 3.1 degrees Celsius. Okay? So we've got those pieces, two pieces of information, and we also have our I. This is a covalent compound, so it has an I equal to 1. So from this information, we have everything for this equation. So we have our delta Tf, we have our I, and we have our Kf. We can solve for molality. Okay, So I'm going to rearrange molality is equal to delta Tf, or negative delta Tf, over I times by molality, or sorry, times by um, Kf. So we have a negative 3.1 as our delta Tf, so molality will equal 3.1 degrees Celsius over 1 times by our Kf, 40.0 degrees Celsius over molality. Solve for that, we get a molality of 0 0.0775 molar. Remember, molality is equal to moles of solute over kilograms of solvent and that's another thing we have. We have our kilograms of our solvent. 22.01 grams is the same as 0 0.02201 kilograms. So we're going to put that, multiply it by the molality we just got to get our moles of solute. So 0 0.0775 molo times by 0 0.0220 one kilograms gives us 0 0.00717 moles of solute. Last thing we want to do, now that we have our moles of solute, we want to determine our molar mass for our solute. Remember molar mass is always grams over moles. We have grams, we have moles, so we're going to take 0 0.186 grams divided by 0 0.00171 moles, and we get a molar mass of 108.9 grams per mole. Okay. Now, let's use a solution that we have a measured quantity for, or measured property, and figure out the experimental Van Hoff factor. So our Van Hoff factor is equal to our measured property over the property calculated for a non-electrolyte. So I is equal to 1. So let's look and see. So we want to calculate our Van Hoff factor. We have a 0 0.050 molar solution of magnesium chloride that has a measured 
freezing point of negative 0.25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so what we have is this right here. What we need to solve for is this right here. So we have to figure out what the property calculated for a non-electrolyte would be. So uh, we can we use delta Tf is equal to negative I Kf times by molality. This is an aqueous solution. So our Kf is equal to 1.86 degrees Celsius over molality. And we want this for a non-electrolyte, so our I is equal to 1. And then our concentration in molality is 0 0.050 molal. So delta Tf is equal to negative 1 times by 1.86 degrees Celsius over molal times by 0 0.050. 050 molo. It gets us a delta Tf of negative 0 0.093 degrees Celsius. And we'll now put all of that into our Van Hoft equation. So negative 0 0.25 degrees Celsius, our measured property, divided by our calculated for a non-electrolyte negative 0 0.093 degrees Celsius. We calculate that out, we get a value of 2.7. For magnesium chloride, a, um, a value that we would expect for our Van Hoff factor would be three. Okay, that would be our guess for our Van Hoff factor. So we're not too far off. It is a fairly dilute solution, so a 2.7 um, it would be a reasonable value. Let's look at our last property, osmosis. So osmosis, we have a system where we have a semipermeable membrane, and osmosis itself is the net movement of a solvent through a semipermeable membrane. A semipermeable membrane itself is one that only allows certain things through, semipermeable. Um, the net movement is going to be your solvent going from lower solute concentration to higher solute concentration. We can see what's going on in this little gif down here. So the little blue balls are uh, water, the little green balls are sugar. Sugar is too large to pass through the semipermeable membrane. So in order to equalize concentration, our water is going to move towards the area with the higher sugar concentration, lower water concentration. That uh, osmosis process will occur until we have the concentrations the same on both sides of the semipermeable membrane. The membranes themselves will allow water and other small molecules to pass while blocking the movement of large solute molecules or ions. So what occurs is we have an area with high concentration, an area with low concentration, and the solvent will flow from the area of low concentration to the area of high concentration. It can very easily flow um, from the low to high because we don't have anything blocking the way. But the higher concentration, the solute is going to block the semipermeable membrane, so it's not going to go very fast in the other direction. So it's going to have a very slow rate of um, solvent flowing back to the low concentration. So we have high concentration or high rate going from low concentration to high concentration, low rate going from high concentration to low concentration. That'll keep on occurring until we get to a point where we have the equilibrium concentration equal on both sides. So once we have um, the concentration being equivalent on both sides, the solvent will reach a the solvent floor will reach an equilibrium um, and we will no longer have a net flow in any direction. One way that we look at um, osmosis is with osmotic pressure. So when we have water flowing through a membrane, this causes pressure buildup. Um, we usually look at that in terms of osmotic pressure uh, and osmotic pressure is formed by the flow of water. We can also look at osmotic pressure as a pressure that must be applied in order to stop osmosis from occurring. So 
if we apply um, the osmotic or osmotic pressure to the higher concentration solution, we will stop osmosis from occurring, um, and uh, the pressure of the excess fluid uh, once concentrate or once concentration is on equal on both sides are equal. Um, so uh, osmotic pressure. Sorry, osmotic pressure will stop. Um, or osmosis will stop once the osmotic pressure is um, the same on both sides. So once the concentrations are on both the same on both sides, osmotic pressure itself depends on the amount of solute in solution. So the greater the concentration, the greater the osmotic pressure. We can determine our osmotic pressure using the following equation, where our uppercase pi is equal to our Van Hoff factor times by the number of moles of solute over the volume of our solution, so molarity, uh, times by our gas constant, times by our temperature, so I times by molarity times by R times by T. Um, molarity, moles per liter, uh, your ideal, ideal ga gas constant is going to be, um, ooh, sorry, it's going to be uh, liters times by atmospheres over moles times by Kelvin, and our temperature will be in Kelvin. We can reverse, or we can reverse the flow of osmosis by applying an external pressure. So reverse osmosis is when we have um, osmosis occurring the opposite direction. So to cause that to happen, we need to apply a pressure greater than the osmotic pressure. So if we apply an osmotic pressure to the greater um, solute concentration, then we would cause osmosis to stop. And then if that pressure is greater than the osmotic pressure, we will cause reverse osmosis to occur. Reverse osmosis is when solvent moves from the, uh, so the solution with the greater solute concentration to the solution with the less solute concentration. This is a common um, common uh, purification technique. It's used in water purification. Okay. Ta -da. Okay. So we can look at some relative um, terms to determine uh, what the flow of osmosis will be. So we have isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic solutions. So these are going to be solutions on the other side of the semipermeable membrane. So we've got something behind us or on one side of the semipermeable membrane, and then we have these solutions that are either isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic. So an isotonic solution is one that is going to have the same osmotic pressure as the solution on the other side of the uh, semipermeable membrane. As such, our solvent is going to pass at the same rate on both sides. So solvent will flow from our isotonic solution to our other side of our semipermeable membrane and back at the same rate. So we've got osmotic pressure, same amount on both sides. So basically the concentration of solute is the same on both sides of that semipermeable membrane. We have a hypotonic solution. So this is something that has a lower osmotic pressure um, than the thing on the other side of the semipermeable membrane. Um, in this case, we have a lower um, solute concentration in this solution. So your solute is going to move from the hypotonic solution into the thing on the other side of the semipermeable membrane. We also have a hypertonic solution. This is something that has a greater osmotic pressure than the thing on the other side of the semipermeable membrane. As such, we're going to have solvent come from the other side of the semipermeable membrane into the hypertonic solution at a greater rate. We usually think about these solutions in reference to red blood cells. So red blood cells themselves have semipermeable membranes and they have specific concentrations of solute. So if we have something that is isotonic, if we put a red blood cell in an isotonic solution, there is going to be nothing that happens to the red blood cell the flow of water will be the same going into the red blood cell as it is coming out of the red blood cell. So that rate will not change. If we were to put a red blood cell within a hypertonic solution, so a solution with a greater concentration outside of the red blood cell than inside of the red blood cell, the red blood cell itself is going to shrivel. And that's because 
water from inside of the red blood cell is going to move outside of the red blood cell into that hypertonic solution. And this process is called crenellation. And that is this right here. If we put a red blood cell in a hypotonic solution, the hypotonic solution has a lower osmotic pressure. So in order to equalize concentration, the water will move from the hypotonic solution into the red blood cell, and this will occur until we get a, red, a swollen red blood cell or until they burst. Um, and this process is called hemolysis. So whenever you are making a solution, if you intend on making uh, IV solutions, you want to make isotonic solutions so the red blood cells do not crenellate or uh, hemolyse. So let's look at our different calculations that we can do. So we can calculate molar mass using our changes in property. So if we're looking at our colligative properties, vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, or osmotic pressure, we can determine the molar mass of any one of these. So our molality will be equal to our um, delta TB, so our uh, our boiling point elevation divided by our Van Hoff factor times by our boiling point elevation constant. If we then multiply it by the kilograms of our solution, we will get our moles of our solute, and then that can be taken and you can divide the grams of your solute by those moles. Okay? If we have our molality, or if we want to solve for our molality using our uh, freezing point depression, we take molality is equal to the negative of our freezing point depression over our Van Hoff factor times by our freezing point depression constant. After we've figured out what our molality is, we can multiply it by the kilograms of our solution, and that will give us our moles of our solute, which can then be placed under our grams of our solute to figure out our molar mass. We can also do the same thing using osmotic pressure. So we'll take our osmotic pressure divided by our Van Hoff factor time, divided by our gas constant divided by our temperature. In this case, we will solve again for molality or molarity. And then we multiply by how many liters of solution we have and get our moles of our solute. And again, after we have our moles of solute, we're gonna put it underneath our grams of solute to get our molar mass. If we are looking at vapor pressure, keep in mind that our vapor pressure is equal to the mole fraction of our solvent times by the vapor pressure of our solvent. So we arrange this to get our uh, mole fraction of our solvent. And then we can figure out our moles of our solute by taking our moles of our solvent divided by our mole fraction of our solvent and subtract out our moles of solvent. And then that solute mole amount can go down there. And we take our grams divided by our moles. Okay. Let's try another uh, problem, see how we do. So we have a sample of point 205 grams of polystyrene and we have 0 0.0100 liters of solution made of toluene and polystyrene. This solution has a osmotic pressure of 0 0.1 0.121 kilopascals at 25 degrees Celsius. We want to calculate our molar mass of polystyrene. So our molarity is equal to our osmotic pressure divided by our Van Hoff factor times by our gas constant times by our temperature. Okay, so if we look, we've got our osmotic pressure, we've got our temperature, and since we have polystyrene, which is a polymer, we have our I equal to one. Okay, so we've got all of our components. We just need to make sure our units are correct. So we're gonna first 
convert our osmotic pressure into atmosphere. So 1.21 kilopascal, one atmosphere is equal to 101.3 kilopascal. So when we divide that out, we get 0 0.0119 atmospheres. If you are expected to go from kilopascals to atmospheres, you would be given that unit converter. Okay, so now we have that, and we can put all of our pieces into our molarity equation. So molarity big M is equal to 0 0.019119 atmospheres divided by 1, our Van Hoff factor, times by 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres over mole Kelvin, and then times by our uh, temperature in Kelvin, 298.15 Kelvin. When we solve this, we get a molarity equal to 0 0.000488 molar. And then we can dive times by our volume to get moles. So 0 0.100 liters. Multiply this out, we get 0 0.000488 moles. And then we're going to take our grams, divide by our moles to get our molar mass. 2.05 grams divided by 0 0.000488 moles. Get a molar mass of 41.99 grams per mole, or 4.20 times 10 to the third grams per mole with the correct number of sig figs. Okay. I was talking about how our Van Hoff factor is not always equal to one, and it's because of what's called ion pairing. Ion pairing is when we have one or more cations held together by one or more anions by electrostatic forces. So when we have those anions and those cations interacting with each other, they act as one particle. As we increase our concentration of our ions, we're going to increase the ion pairing. So if we see over here, we can see how our Van Hoff factor changes as we change our concentrations. So for sucrose, doesn't matter what concentration we're at, there are no ion pairs, so or there are no ions, so there are no ion pairs, so our Van Hoff factor does not change. However, we can see with sodium chloride, potassium sulfate, and magnesium sulfate that they are going to vary greatly with concentration. So these are our higher concentration, and these are our lower concentration. And as we lower that concentration, as we come, become more dilute, we get closer and closer to that expected value. Last subject we want to go over is colloids. So these are going to be suspensions of particles larger than individual ions or molecules. Um, they are too small to settle out by gravity, um, but they are too large to become a solution. Um, we have a bunch of different types of colloids. Um, so if we have a uh, gas and gas, this is the only example where we do not have any colloid. Gas and gas, their particles are too small. They are going to mix. Our delta H of mixing will be um, very favorable due to entropy. So there is no gas-gas uh, colloid, but we can have a colloid with, with any other type of um, solute and solvent. So if we have a gas um, colloid dispersed in a liquid, we have an aerosol. Um, so something like fog. Um, so, uh, sorry, if we have a, so it's our gas solvent, liquid solute. So liquid particles are dispersed throughout a gas. This is a aerosol, like fog. Um, if we have a gas solvent, solid solute, this is another aerosol called smoke. If we have a liquid solvent, 
gas solute. This is a foam, like whipped cream. So anytime you're making whipped cream, you do it vigorously in order to get all those gas particles in there. Liquid, liquid. So if they're not going to mix because of particle size or uh, unlike intermolecular forces, we get an emulsion. Milk would be an example of this where we've got um, we've got different substances like fats that are not actually going into solution because they're too big, but they are still liquid. Liquid solvent, solid solute. We call this a sol. Paint is considered a sol. Solid solvent, gas solute. This is a solid form, foam, like a marshmallow. Solid liquid, solid emulsion. Butter would be an example of this. So we have our solid butter. Um, it does have some liquid throughout there. And then solid, solid, something like ruby glass. Okay, so got some colloids in every phase except for gas gas. To determine if we have a solid or a uh, colloid, we can use what's called the Tyndall effect. The Tyndall effect, colloids themselves are going to scatter our rays of light while solutions don't. The reason this occurs is because our particles in a colloid are larger. So because they are so large, they're going to cause the light itself to um, reflect off of them or refract off of them. So here, this is a solution. This is a colloid. So the colloid, you'll actually see light. We call this the Tyndall effect. Okay. We have things that are called hydrophilic colloids and hydrophobic colloids. So if we have something that is hydrophilic, it's going to be something that is um, water loving. Um, water loving, obviously something that loves water. So hydrophilic, um, we can see this is a hydrophilic one. So we have polar and uh, charged groups on the molecule that helps them remain dispersed in water. And then we have hydrophobic, water fearing. Um, those are going to be ones that don't like water, right? So they're gonna be oils and stuff like that. Um, with our hydrophobic ones, we can have, um, or the hydrophobic colloids, we can actually have ions that will adhere to the surface in order to make them interact with a aqueous solution. So over here, we've got our hydrophobic colloid. Doesn't really like um, the water, so it kind of has a hydrophobic area that interacts with itself, and then uh, we have ions that will allow the hydrophilic area of it to interact with water. Fact emulsion uh, is uh, okay. So colloids can be either hydrophilic or hydrophobic in nature. So are they? either um, water loving, hydrophilic, or water fearing, fearing hydrophobic. So water loving are gonna be polar substances or things with polar areas. Uh, hydrophilic are going to be things that are non-polar in nature. So um, our hydrophilic polar substances, polar groups with on, are on our um, hydrophilic colloids will interact with water and keep that um, substance dispersed in water uh, or any other polar substances. Um, so they stay within water through their polar groups. They are not going to be dissolved in water because they're large. So this is going to be stuff like proteins. Proteins are can be considered um, hydrophilic um, colloids because they're large substances that are dispersed within water. Our hydrophilic colloids must have some area that um, has a uh, polar substance or some polar area if we want it to interact with water. So an oil droplet itself, if we throw it in water, it's not going to interact at all. However, if we add something like an emulsifying agent, so something that can 
uh, combine with the oil droplet to cause emulsification or um, colloid formation, uh, we can get an area that will interact with the oil. So a nonpolar area will interact with an oil droplet. And then we have a ionic area. So an ion attached, so some cation attached to an ionic part of our um, emulsifying agent that can interact with water. So these emulsifying agents allow stuff like oil droplets to become hydrophobic colloids um, and that are suspended within water. The stabilization of these hydrophobic colloids through, um, through emulsifying agents is a very important part of uh, fat digestion. So the colloid stabilization occurs during the emulsification of fats and oils. Sorry. Um, so as a fat globule, a big thing of fat that is not interacting with water gets um, ingested and goes into our gallbladder, our gallbladder is going to release bile salts. Those bile salts act as um, emulsify emulsifying agents, um, stabilizing the colloids and allowing those colloids to interact with the water. So as that occurs, we can dissolve those fat droplets and during that uh, dissolving of those fat droplets or digesting of those fat droplets, we can digest and absorb fat soluble vitamins. So the bile salts are the emulsifying agent, the fat gobble plus the um, bile salts are gonna be our uh, nonpolar or hydrophobic uh, colloids. So they are emulsified. What would make a good emulsifying agent? So we have an emulsifying agent is one that stabilizes the hydrophobic colloid in a hydrophilic solvent. And what of these would be a good emulsifying agent? So we need something that's going to stabilize our substance. So it has to have a nonpolar area and it has to have an ionic area. This will be the correct answer. This is going to be our best emulsifying agent. And it's because it has a long hydrophobic chain, an ionic area, so that it can interact with both the water and the hydrophobic colloid. And the last thing we want to look at is called Brownian motion. Brownian motion is the erratic random movement of microscopic particles. Those microscopic particles can either be colloids or gas particles. And the movement is through a fluid, so the fluid will either be some sort of solvent, um, some sort of liquid solvent, or a um, gas. So uh, Brownian motion itself occurs by the um, continuous bombardment of those particles by surrounding atoms or molecules. Um, those that random motion looks like this. So this yellow thing is that particle, and every time it gets hit, it changes its direction. The distance between collisions can be averaged out to give us what's called the mean free path, which is the average distance traveled by a particle between collisions or other particles, between collisions with other particles. This mean free path is going to be particle dependent particle size dependent. So here we have a bunch of colloids of different sizes. We're going from one to 1,000 nanometers. And our mean free path is going from 1.23 millimeters to 0 0.039 millimeters. So we can see from this that as we increase our particle size, we decrease our mean free path. So why do larger particles, colloids or gases, have shorter mean free paths? The answer is because the larger particle we have more frequent collisions. So more frequent collisions means that we have shorter mean free path. So more frequent collisions 
So shorter distance between collisions. And therefore we have a shorter mean free path. That's everything I have for you guys today. You guys have a great week and I'll see you guys next time.